So hey everybody, uh, my name is Luis Cruel. I'm a senior technical artist over at SideFX, and then today I'm going to be talking about the game tool shelves that I've built for 16. Thanks for coming. I know it's lunch, and I appreciate you guys being here. And it's a busy week, so you've probably given up a lot of stuff to spend the time with us. Um, so I've been in the game industry for about 10 years before I joined SideFX. I joined last May, and then my whole uh, idea and my agenda is to basically be able to get data out of Houdini into game engines as performant as possible. So the idea is that there's all these things you can create inside of Houdini, let's get that into game engines and let's kind of help the game artist's workflow be a little bit uh, more smooth. So one of the things that we did was this Vertex or this uh, game tool shelves and one of the examples is the Vertex animation tools which I'm sure most of you guys are here for. Um, so let's take a look at what that looks like. Um, so this is a file from Magnus Larson over at Machine Games, and he was one of our beta testers. So this was interesting because it, he just had some files lying around that he did for kind of personal tests. And I was like, hey, let's try to get those things in game. And let's just see something that wasn't really designed for games, but it looks really cool. And let's try to get that to run. And this is using your new kind of geometry caching technique that basically writes out the cache to textures and then plays it back inside of uh, Unreal or Unity or wherever you want and in this case he used Houdini for the lava flow and then mega scans for the rocks and then rendered everything out inside of Unreal. So if you guys were here last year you probably remember Steven Bircher who's over at uh, in the industry now doing stuff but he had these this kind of prototype of a game stool shelf and he put it up on GitHub and this is the kind of spiritual successor to that. Some of the tools that he's written, we kind of brought it into Houdini proper, and then some we've kind of modified. But the, the goal of it is kind of working on these kind of common game workflows, basically people that hear about Houdini, and they're like, okay, I want to do some of these things. Some of these things are the things that I know Houdini's kind of good at. How do I get it into the game engine as soon as possible? Like a feedback that we're getting a lot this week, which is really good, is if I'm trying to pitch this internally, not only do I need to learn the software, I need to produce something, I need to get something in my game engine all at the same time to kind of be able to pitch Houdini internally. So being able to kind of get from point A to game as soon as possible is something that is kind of close to my heart. And then this is still very much a work in progress. So we've done this tool shelf, it's in Houdini 16. We want your feedback. We want to see yay, nay, what things are good. Like do you guys really care about the normal map tools? Not relevant at all. Do you guys really care about the vertex animation stuff? Let's move that forward. What else do you like to see? And then we can kind of build uh, the tools uh, moving forward based on your feedback, which is really cool because we're kind of taking the industry feedback and kind of pivoting around what you guys need, um, which I feel is, is unique. So some of the tools that we've built so far, uh, we have a normal map COPS. So COPS is our compositing network inside of Houdini, so basically image editing. Uh, we've added some features to be able to work with normal maps a little bit easier. Uh, Thanks for getting flow maps uh, out of Houdini, which is kind of a common workflow that everybody sees the Uncharted and the portals and they're like, okay, that's really cool, how do I do that? So we're kind of making that workflow a little more encapsulated, a little bit easier to use. Um, then uh, something to make things loop and I'll go through the, each of these kind of deep dive because we have an hour and I want to get you guys' feedback. Uh, making things loop is just another one that everybody wants to try to do and it's just like pain, and not a pain, but it's really easy, but you're gonna have to go and learn how to do it and then do it. Uh, rendering out texture sheets is another one of those that it's really simple to do. And we haven't bothered to kind of wrap it up in a higher construct yet because it's so simple to do, but there is value in kind of wrapping things up and kind of making it even easier for a user to kind of get in and, and get it done. Same with exporting uh, destruction is a common kind of thing. Like Houdini's great at destruction, so getting destruction out into an FBX friendly format so you can bring it into Unreal or Unity. And then finally, that vertex animation, which I'm really, really proud of because there's two talks going on at GDC right now, uh, one on Thursday and one on Friday, basically talking about this technique. So now you have a DCC app that is kind of with the industry to where there's a GDC presenting this new tech, or GDC talks presenting this new tech, and you have a DCC app that already has that built in and can support it. So when you come back home and you're like, oh, I saw this cool talk about geometry caching, now you can actually have something that works and you don't have to implement your own tech and kind of get that running. You can just use it and kind of prove your point. So the normal map tools. Uh, they're fairly straightforward, so those are the kind of basic things that you would expect to be able to do with a normal map. You want to be able to rotate it and have the normals be corrected. You want to be able to combine two normal maps together properly. You want to be able to invert the, the channel, so like if you get something out and maybe you render it out a texture sheet and you just want to flip the Y, you just that should be something that is fairly common and, and we, we want to do. Uh, the same with levels, if you just want to kind of like uh, add some contrast or kind of kill it a little bit and then rotate it and normalize it. 
And then the nice thing about all of these tools is that there is no black boxes. There is no magic C++ code underneath. It's all exposed. You guys can go in and deep dive. Traditionally, what we do is we'll have a button that spits out a bunch of nodes, and then it's up to you to kind of make sense of it a little bit. And what I'm trying to do is basically encapsulate <coughs> that into an HDA. You can still can go into if you want to learn deeper about it, um, but you, you basically can work at that higher level. And then it also shows that we are looking into COPS more seriously because we're getting a lot of feedback from the industry of people that are like, hey, I'm using COPS for generating textures, and there's all these things that I want to be able to do, like pulling out curvature. Uh, we redid a lot of our baking tools inside of uh, 16. So there's a lot of more movement to where COPS originally was supposed to be a compositing for film, but the game industry is kind of taking that over. So we're like, hey, if we have an excuse to work on this stuff and if there's interesting, yes, like all we need is ammunition so we can kind of pitch it and be able to work on it. Then flow maps is another thing that is kind of, this is the first kind of entry bar. And that was my first entry bar. So I like, I did a, a map for Halo where we basically use Houdini to kind of get that in and basically do a similar technique to this, not exactly, but uh, which is you want to run a simulation on your level geometry and then you want to basically freeze a frame of that simulation and then you want to basically take the velocities of the particles as they're moving through space and then freeze that as basically flow map vectors that you can then play inside of your game editor. So now you get really nice things like not only the geometry looks more interesting than just like a flat plane or someone kind of hand sculpted it and it kind of doesn't really make sense. Um, but now you get these little nice eddies and all these kind of reviews and the other cool thing is that you can actually get like the vorticity from the simulation and now all your foam maps are generated for you and they're all in the right place so based whenever there's churn you can actually use that map bake it out and get it in game so we've written four different nodes to kind of help you work with flow maps a little bit better uh, one of them is to basically be able to initialize the flow map so you can just create the, the velocity vectors and be able to visualize them and to guide them so basically you can drive them with curves which is a common workflow where you just kind of want to a little bit more control. Uh, be able to drop down obstacles. So if you have like a pier or rocks or something that you want the the, the flow map to kind of bend around it, now that's just a node. And then the the really cool one is the the two color one, which is basically we actually do the right math of getting the tangent binormals and normals of the surface calculated, and then we move the the velocities that are in world space to be in tangent space. So you actually get accurate uh, velocities in tangent space. Um, so the workflow of being able to comb the normal maps. There's actually like a comb node, like we didn't really want to write one because it already exists and it works with velocities by default. So just being able to comb the geometry is just built in. Um, but so we have a really good talk on a piece on Uncharted 4 and how they use a similar kind of curve workflow to the drive their flow maps. And then there's a famous kind of, that's a lot of entry point for people for Houdini and for me personally, where it was a SIGGRAPH talk for Portal 2 that Valve gave on basically how they use Houdini to kind of comb their flow maps for Portal 2. And then the nice thing about being able to have that uh, world space to tangent space conversion is that you can do things like waterfalls because if you just have the velocities that are kind of moving across the surface and then down, you're moving from the x vector down to the y vector. And that's usually if you just bake the velocities by themselves, you're going to get the data that doesn't match. But by being able to convert it down into the tangent space, you can have the, the, the flow map accurately follow the surface of the, the simulation. And then again, just to show that we're kind of transparent as possible with these, that's the math to do the world space to tangent space conversion. So you can check our math and make sure it's good. Um, or just learn and if you're curious and you just want to kind of learn a little bit more about Houdini. And then the being able to do the combing is really straightforward. It's just a resample node that you just drop. Or you resample the curve, you do a polyframe, so you basically get the tangency of the curve is now the velocity vector, and then you transfer that over into your mesh. And then the obstacle one is just a magnet node, which I actually didn't even know existed until I asked around side effects a little bit. And it, it's perfect for that. It basically, it takes meta balls, and then you can basically push vectors around with it. The other tool that I have is a make loop tool. And this is really, really basic, but it's something that for new users, it feels like magic because this is like a painful process to do if you're trying to bring this into another software and try to make something loop. And you're kind of trying to line up frames and trying to crossfade them by hand. Um, you, now you just drop a, a node that says make loop and then the, the simulation loops. And then it works for both uh, vectors or uh, not vectors, volumes and points. So if you have cloth, it just it's the same node and internally we do a switch to figure out what it is. So 
Exactly. Yeah. So basically, it's based on here. You have like a start frame and end frame. Basically, what you want your bookends to be. You can control the number of loops in case you want to see what the the loops are. And then basically, all it does is it basically offsets the simulation by half, and then it just does a sine wave to kind of crossfade in between the two. Because if you offset it now, your seam is transparent over here where the end used to be, and then now you have a thing. So basically, you blend over here, and then you go over there, and you just do a crossfade. And it's not. On a simulation like cloth, it's not physically accurate and there's better ways of blending it, but it looks 90% like I actually did something to where I was like, I'm figuring out the first frame of the simulation, the last frame of the simulation, and then I applied the delta over time to get it mathematically perfect. And it was like, yeah, it takes a long time to compute and the, just the crossfade works 90% of the time. Yeah, if you have questions, like, please stop. This is for you guys, so this is not like a formal presentation at all. And so the other one is basically texture sheets. This is something that everybody has to do at some point, which is basically you just render it out to uh, image sequence and then you use a mosaic node to kind of composite that back together. Again, just kind of wrapping things up a little bit and getting that a little bit easier. The nice thing that we can do is generate normals and there's a, a little, uh, uh, I'll go back to that. I'll get into that later. But we can actually generate the normals from the simulation accurately and not do kind of some shenanigans where you have, oh, I have a green light and a red light and then a blue light to try to get the vectors to show up. And that kind of works sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't, depends on your effect. In Houdini, we can actually calculate the normals from the vectors or from the volume, or the normals from the volumes accurately and then just render that out. What is this one called? Uh, the texture sheets. Texture sheet, okay. Yeah. And all, most of these are in the out context because that's where you render things out from. So we wanted to kind of keep it. Did it no, so Mosaic is in COPS, so we still call Mosaic inside of it. Okay. Um, so they do the same thing, but I kind of just bootstrapped the whole thing to where it's like, you had a render node, and then you have to go into COPS and then do a Mosaic, and then it's a good workflow, but like if you make a change and you want to update it, now you have to render it, and then you have to go to the Mosaic and then render it again. So I'd rather just kind of make it together. So if you make a change in your simulation, you just hit button, and then you get the texture sheets at the end of it. So you're just kind of hot wiring them together, and it's mostly just for a workflow enhancement. Uh, what do you mean by that? So let's say you have an ocean, right? Yeah. And I want to get that into, I want to have a tile texture of that ocean. Yeah. But I want the normal map of it. Yeah. And the actual foam, but we need to clean the, that got sort of taken away. Because you see the, um, now the foam is point particularly. Okay. So how, how will you export that data out? I'll have to double check, but the way I w we have the, I would just bake it. I wouldn't necessarily maybe render it. Well, I guess you could because it's just on a plane, but I would just use a baking. But if you're rendering it with a tile, right? Because your, your, your display edges will have. You should. Yeah, we can we can figure it out, and um, it should be possible. So you could make oceans loop with the make loop tool, um, so you can get that to be seamless because it's just the same point. It's just a grid, right? Well, how do um, I get the, 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 the foam attribute? Yeah, a no, yeah, a normal map uh huh. Of that, of that the white water. So you know how the, you can export out the texture, you can export out the foam, you can display the map. Yeah. Um, how would you trans how would you translate that into in a normal information uh, from that texture data that you have? You could do the normal map cop to kind of basically do a, a regular kind of foam, like a normal map, like you basically do like an emboss, like a crazy bump thing. Uh, you could get a normal map that way. Um, that would be the easiest one. That like if you just have the white water kind of black and white map, you can just do a, the normal map cop, and now you have a normal map out of it. It wouldn't be super accurate, um, but then the other way you could do is actually build the foam mesh out of it, uh, which is kind of like the Piper guys from Pixar did, to where actually you just do like a meta ball thing, and then you actually generate a mesh out of it, and then from that you can do a normal map properly. Um, it's slightly different from this because this is just like pyro type stuff. Um, 
but you could do it that way too. And like the way I actually had it before was I would have the, the pyro and then I would mesh the pyro and then I would render the normals out of that mesh. Um, and then I found out that we had this way of just tapping the volumes directly. Um, so the way I would do it would probably be that. Does, okay. that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so the, because we can actually like tap the geometry itself, you can get actually normal maps that look and feel proper. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and then there's, there's there's just like a render property, which I actually do. It was like in the Japanese website, like Kentucky, one of our Jap the the sales the, the accounts representative for Japan had a t whole tutorial on it. And so when I showed him the mesh version, he was like, "Oh no, we have this other way. That is just like there's a, a render property that you can just compute normals from volumes." And then I added that in as a feature. And then yeah, you can see that we are using the mosaic node. And all I'm doing in there is basically I take it and then I do the mosaic. And then I actually have to normalize the normal map from being from zero to one to being from, or from being from negative one to one to being from zero to one, and then export that out. And then I just scale them to the size of the texture that I want, and then you're, you're done. And then the other one is something that Steven actually had, um, but I modified it a little bit. So Steven had this tool that could take uh, DOP data from pack primitives and then export that out into FBX. Uh, the problem with that was that you had to have the DOP simulation within the scene so you could actually tap it and then get data out of it. So I rewrote it so you can do it with vertex cache. So you can actually write things out to the file and then you can get it from the actual cache, the back primitive data into FDX. And this is fairly typical workflow where you have a destruction sequence and then you turn that basically into a skeletal sequence inside your game engine and then you just play it back like if it was a character. And then, yeah, basically what we do here is you have all these point data attributes running in the pack primitives, and you want to basically make objects out of each of those. So we just go through each individual one and just kind of promote that up into the object level from the sub level. How, how about a way to export uh, TD, or, you know, TDI files, a vector field from Houdini? Yeah, so there is a, there's a, a couple of FXA files. Yeah. Yeah, so there is one in Orbolt that, I don't know, uh, there's two, I think. There's one that Steven wrote. And then there's one on Orbolt that people tend to use. If that's something that you guys want, that's something on my list that I'm like, is there an interest to that? And yeah, if there is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. field, but it's always centered at the origin, mm. so you never know how to get it, how do you get it to match? To, to get back into the original to place? To get back into the original place, so yeah. let's say, let's say I will, like, I've never been able to get a vector field from Houdini, import yeah. it out in the space in the world that it is, yeah. and have it exactly follow okay. what one. So the, Mike Linden, who should be here a little bit later, actually had that in the, I don't know if you've seen his, the, the webinar on Gears of War, so what he did was he did a flow map simulation, and then he actually just extruded that vector field up a few levels, uh, which was really cool. So you have basically a flow map of like sand moving and then you just kind of have that flowing. But then he took those velocities and just kind of copy stamped them up. And now you have a 3D vector field of the same kind of movement of the wind. And then he spawned GPU particles that kind of flew it perfectly. Um, there's multiple ways of getting that information out. So for the vertex animation textures, I just have an attribute that I write to in the HDA that is like, this is what the numbers that you need to plug into Unreal are. And this is the X, Y position that you need to use. And then you just basically, you hit it, and then it, this is gonna be like, these are data that you're gonna need to copy and paste. And then now you just have it to where you can copy and paste it. But if that's something that a lot of people we use, we can, there's things like, the vertex animation tools have gotten enough attention that we're just gonna build them into Houdini Engine. And we're just gonna, instead of doing all the shenanigans of copy and pasting, we just wanna make that easier to work and be able to kind of bring that in. Um, hopefully that answers but yeah the, the FXA stuff is something that a lot of people have mentioned it to the point that I'm like okay yeah that's another tool that will be nice on the docket to kind of officialize and support but that's a good feedback of being able to move it out in the world and have it match with the, the, the geometry in the, the game so getting into that vertex animation texture stuff let's see if those will play yeah so the idea here is you have a simulation inside of Houdini and then you want to get that same simulation out in game 
And the way traditionally this has been done is through Alembic. And the problem with Alembic is that basically it generates a, a mesh every single frame. And then we, I was just talking to someone that they're like, yeah, I tried to export this, but it was like a gig file. And then I was trying to import a gig file and it just kind of collapsed on itself. And, and that's just like an inherent problem of storing every single frame. So what the way we're doing this technique is we're basically writing out the data into textures and then we're reading that back into the vertex shader. So there's no kind of geometry generation during at runtime. The geometry is already exported and all we're doing is just setting positions and normals uh, at runtime. So there's four different techniques and there's four basically a drop down and we can go into this a little bit more. Sorry, you're, yeah? You're writing data into textures? Correct. And, and then reading that in the vertex shader. And then taking those, because basically you write out, and I'll get into this a little bit, um, you write out the position and the normal to textures, and then on the vertex shader, you just read it right back out um, with the, but I'll, I'll get into it, don't worry. Um, so there's four main ways of, uh, four types of data that you can get out. So we're calling these based on Ben uh, Laidlaw, who's giving a talk, uh, just naming convention. This is like, this is new, what do I call this? And we just figured out we call it the same thing. So soft is for things of same topology, so things like ocean flags, uh, soft body dynamics and skin characters. Rigid is for moving chunks, so like rigid body dynamics. Fluid is for the kind of crazy different topology simulation stuff. And then sprite is for camera facing if you just want like traditional particles that you just want to spawn. So the first one is for something with consistent topology. So even with this, you can get a lot out of it. And this is kind of like the cheapest possible thing you could do. Um, but the Naughty Dog guys are using a similar technique to spawn chickens with their particle systems because now you can spawn static meshes with most particle systems and now those static meshes can have animations on them so you can spawn things like birds or kind of ambient noise characters and things of that nature, fish um, and have those be playing an animation cached. And so that guy, and it, it's nice because that guy I think is like 10,000 versus just the default Houdini guy um, but he has 26 frames so actually the data to kind of store a walking loop cycle is not that big um, so you can get actually that is essentially sequential blend shapes one per frame playing back. So what we actually do is we store the position and the normals out into a texture. So every point in the, or every pixel is actually a point. So, and then every pixel can have a red, green, and blue component, and every point can have an X, Y, and Z coordinate. So basically we just take those values and store it right back on the texture. Uh, the downside of this, which is not really a downside, is that you can't compress it, because if you compress the data kind of gets mungled. Um, but the texture sizes aren't that big based on, for most of the effects, like there's people that are like, oh, I want to do something that's like 8,000 particles with uh, 2,000 frames. And it's like, yeah, you're going to have a, a sizable texture. But for 90% of the things that I've been able to pull off, the texture sizes are within range and way smaller than an Olympic ash. Um, so the other thing too we store is an additional UV set on the mesh. So basically we just do a UV set that is horizontal, that basically lines up the position of where the textures are going to be and the positions of the point. So basically you can kind of read that back in. And then the shader is super simple. So all the shader has to do is just scroll down. And then as it's scrolling down, it's basically reading the texture at that index, and then it's going to play, play it back and just set the normals and then set the positions. And then, yeah, the, the shaders, this is an example of the cloth shader. And this is fairly straightforward. I don't know if I have a mouse, I do. Um, so this is basically reading the, uh, generating the UVs, which is just basically doing some flipbook math to basically instead of scrolling properly or kind of scrolling in chunks um, just so it's a little bit um, you don't get garbled interpolation data and then here you're sampling the normals and then you're feeding that into the custom UV channels of Unreal so you can then read it back in and feed it into the normals and the reason we do that is so the texture gets read in the vertex shader not the pixel shader and so it gets calculated once per vert not once per pixel and then you have the position which just gets multiplied by the actor uh, transforms and then shoved in so it's it's fairly fairly light and all of the math is happening on the vertex shader which is usually not your bottleneck because usually most of the math for your shader is happening on the pixel shader the next one that we can do is uh, kind of like the next step from that is being able to do destruction the same way so you can now work the same way and get either skeletal mesh animation out of it or you can get vertex data out of it and the artist doesn't really have to worry about that. The artist just needs to be artist and make the destruction look awesome. And then as tech artists or kind of pipeline TDs or maybe your senior artist will make the decision, okay, this one should go as textures or this one should go as uh, a skeletal mesh. The nice thing about doing it this way because everything is being calculated on the GPU is that then you can do things like something with thousands and uh, multiple thousands of uh, points. 
And if you're going to try to do this with a mesh, either you're going to have to subsection things and then do kind of cluster of uh, different palettes of joints or do some shenanigans to kind of get it to play back. But you can, uh, this I think is like 4,000 pieces and an artist called Martin Romero did it, uh, which was, it, it, it's great. He's going to be talking at the popcorn effects booth today too, or I think today. And then for the, the way this is done is instead of storing the position and the normals like we did for last one, we store the position and the quaternions for each point. And then we store the pivot of each chunk in the vertex colors of it. So now we have the center of the chunk for all your points. And then we have the position in space animated. And then we have the rotation in space animated. So with all those, that data, we can just recreate that animation back. Uh, and all of the chunk verts have the same UV, so they all sample from the same position sample. Um, so it, the data is actually fairly light because you have, instead of like if you have this mesh that might be like 50,000 polys, uh, you only have however many chunks you have as animation data. And you guys like, if you guys have questions, we can dive into it a little bit, or I can go through it and then we can talk about it. Yeah. I feel like it's about the soft stuff, but I was kind of curious. You kind of started talking about a question. Um, is there a practical um, length? Like, like, for example, if you're doing some stuff, yeah. you're probably going to use like a 64 or a 32, right. like, you yeah. see which one is that. Um, is it the bird density or the polygon count and the, and the frame the length? Multiply those two together will basically give you the amount of data that you need. And then practically we found that about 6,000 uh, pixels is kind of the kind of threshold of, uh, perform not performance, but of accuracy that the data can kind of handle. So once you start getting past like a 6K by 6K catcher, things start to degrade. Um, but the nice thing, which actually is something that is a little bit unique that we do is traditionally people will just kind of write it out to a line and then once you hit 8K verts, you, you have to stop because you have 8K pixels. Uh, we're actually making, uh, we're, we can break that up and then make multiple lines per frame as opposed to being a single line per frame. So then you can have something with like 30,000 points. And then if you have something that's like 30,000 points but you only have 100 frames, you basically, you can compress that down to where you can basically divide what 30,000 divided by 1024 and then you figure out how many rows per frame you're gonna have. And then because we already have that kind of, um, flipbook animation, we can basically hop whole chunks at a time. Um, and that's something that was cool. And that's the only reason why we can get that big uh, 9,000 character in, because yeah, you can basically break that up and say, oh, I want a 512 texture. Generally, I'm staying, like I found that I can usually get most of the effects done with like a 1024, and then you're gonna get like a 1024, but maybe like a 597. And it doesn't actually doesn't need to be power two, and that's something that I need to break because power of two is just because you want block compressing and because these are uncompressed textures it doesn't really matter but it's just kind of like muscle muscle memory you're like oh i want a 1024 by 512 and it's like well it doesn't matter you can then you do 1024 and you're going to get 1024 by 532 and then you kind of cringe a little bit because it's not a power of two and then you you're kind of like okay it doesn't matter because we're not compressing it and then uh, i know just while we're kind of on this tangent uh there's also new so the first version of this you had to write out EXR data, and that's the one that I presented over at Epic. Um, because you have things that go from like negative numbers to really massive numbers, I've actually figured out, not figured out a way, but now I can have an actual, uh, a way to packing that data from zero to one. So now you don't need an HDR texture anymore. And that's the one that I have to write out the shader. It's like, this is the min value and this is the max value. And you just plug that back onto the shader. And then I just unpack the data from zero to one to be from negative 2000 to positive 5000. Um, and then the other thing is, I can actually pack the normal map into the alpha of the position because because we already have an uncompressed texture, we're already eating an alpha channel. Um, so I can drop the last channel and then basically have the two channels that I can then pack down to one channel and pack that into the alpha. So now we kind of quarter the memory usage that we had before to where we had two HDR textures. Now we don't have to have HDR textures anymore and we can do it with one texture. So now we kind of, every time we kind of, either you drop a texture or you go from HDR to LDR, you're kind of halving the texture usage. Um, so now I'm pretty confident. Before when I was showing, I was like, yeah, it could work, but you kind of, it's it's gonna be a little heavy. Now I'm like, yeah, no, you could do, I would do, I would use this in production right now. Um, so the next one is the fluid one. And this one is the really, really cool one. And that's the one that I, I, I don't know if there's any other ways of doing this currently besides Alembic. And Alembic has those problems that I've talked about before. So what we do here is actually we figure out the maximum number of verts that you want 
and then we just generate a cloud of verts based on the bounding box of the simulation so you don't have weird clipping and thing kind of disappearing because it's not on the right bounding box. And then per frame, we just do the same thing as we did with cloth. We just set the positions and the normals. But because we do it per point and we have the normal information, we just reassemble the mesh at runtime every single frame. And it sounds really expensive, but it's not because it's exactly the same as cloth. We're just setting positions and normals. The shaders are almost identical. And the nice thing about this too is that you can just keep writing more textures if you need more data. So I can write temperature values, I can write vorticity, I can write any other kind of, I can write UV, so like if you want to have an effect of cloth staring, you can have them mesh with UVs and then you just store the UVs as another channel that are just two more pieces of data that you read in and then you can recalculate it and then you can pass that through to the pixel shader and then just read it, your textures with it. Um, yeah, and then you just have a cloud of triangles. This is more information on the, the kind of memory usage, so for this effect, which is fairly, I think, decent, um, we have 5,000 frames and 90, or 5,000 triangles and 99 frames. We have a single texture because I can pack that in, and it's about 6.3 megs, which is not horrible for a texture nowadays. Like some of the 4K textures kind of can go up to 25 megs, so this is, is fairly decent. And then the mesh is minimal. The mesh is like 600K, so this is I would say is production possible, and. Um, Alembic, like if you try to do this with Alembic, I should probably looking at 60 megs, easy to kind of get something like that going. And then the last one that I just added last week, and this is kind of like a GDC debut, is something that people ask a lot. It's like, how do I get particles into Unreal? This is how you get particles into Unreal. Um, similar technique to the other one, to where instead of writing out a cloud of triangles, I write out a cloud of quads. And then I just move those into positions. And then because I don't really need normals, because the, it's, they're going to be camera facing, I can stash the scale into the alpha. So now I can have uh, particles that can kind of grow and shrink and move around as they need to. And then on the second texture, I can write out color and alpha. So you can have something like the animation, the, the particles are changing color and kind of fading out and fading in, um, and which is it's the same, pretty much the same shader. So this is the kind of whole thing that you can get, uh, minus the, the sprites because they're too new to make a video of it and to kind of build into this little set, but you can see that just with this one node, there's a lot of cool data that you can get out of Houdini now and get it into games. And this is kind of not bleeding edge because some people have been doing it in games for a long time and just now they're able to talk about it, but now it's public enough and we kind of jumped on it and we felt that we backed the right horse uh, as if it were. So this is, if you want to learn more about it, so Mario Palmero is giving a talk, I think on Thursday, getting into this they actually went further and they're doing like full skin characters with this technique which I think is a little bit beyond the scope of Houdini um, so I kind of didn't go that far and then there's the original Gamma Suit article that they both wrote Norman and Mario where they kind of go through the what's actually happening this he actually has a really good gift to kind of explain that kind of triangle cloud getting reassembled per frame and yeah there's a couple there's one that is his PDF that kind of has the whole back pipeline of how it works and then gamma switcher if you just search norman 3d vertex you, you'll find it and then there's a yeah so the the future tools work i want to get that vertex animation stuff working in unity because there's some shenanigans that i'm probably doing assuming unreal that i want to be able to do it in a different engine just to make sure that as you guys are going into and trying to do your own thing um, you can use it Rate March volumes is something that is kind of like the other thing that I want to be able to get that's just basically getting volumetric data for clouds and any other volumes into uh, Game Engine is another kind of piece of data that you can generate in Houdini, but there's no really good way of getting into games. And then we're going to start GitHub back up and all these tools and probably the FXA one. They'll probably go into GitHub first, get a little bit of round of beating from you guys, and then once it's a little bit more solid, we'll bring it into the build. Um, so you guys kind of have beta access without beta access and before the beta even starts, uh, which I'm, I'm pretty happy with and I'm excited that the side effects is kind of doing this with it. Another more resources is, yeah, go to our website. You guys already know if you're here. Um, Odd Force is a great community. 90% of the times if you put a question up on Google, first result is going to be side effects forum, second result is going to be Odd Force. So those are great resources. Uh, the techartist.org Slack channel is invite only, but if you're kind of in the industry, uh, there's a guy that now he's at Microsoft that he'll just uh, add it in. Uh, Butters, I don't know if you know. He just joined. He's in the HoloLens team out in Vancouver. Uh, oh, yeah. Robert Buttersworth. We call him Butters. 
but he's kind of like the manager of it. And then there's a new one that the community kind of started and it's the Discord server called Think Procedural. And this is really exciting because basically there's about 300 people online daily and all of the film Houdini users are there. So you ask a question and like Matt Estella will kind of go and give you some tips on how to use it. What is it? Uh, it's called Discord. And it's basically like another chat program like Slack. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it's like a gaming thing. And like, but like there's a Polycount one, there's an Unreal one, there's an Logarithmic one. Uh, we don't, it's not official, but the community kind of took it and, and ran with it. Uh, and there's a lot like all of the people like the Antagma videos, if you guys are familiar with that, those guys are there. Um, so it's just like a great resources. We have a lot of developers actually going there now just because there's 300 people. So a lot of the engine team for Unreal is there. Um, so it's just like a great place to just, there's, it's a little more organized to the Slack. So Slack is good because it's not Houdini specific. So there's just like channels for Maya, there's channels for Simply Gone, there's channels for Substance. So it's just kind of like tech card community kind of getting together. The, the Discord server is actually just Houdini and there's a channel for real time. There's a channel for modeling, there's a channel for animation. So it's kind of specifically Houdini and then you get film people there. Um, so now it's kind of free flow Jazz Odyssey and we'll just kind of go and and I have some examples of the Vertex animation stuff running in Unreal, if you guys want to dive in, dip into it. If you have other stuff, I can try to answer. If not, um, I can get you answers. But I know it's lunch too. If you guys want to peel off, it's understandable. But uh, yeah, what do you guys want to do? So here's the things running in Unreal. So this is an example with the pig heads. So you can kind of see, so this is the sprite one. Um, this is the rigid body one. This is the cloth one. And then there's a couple of examples of fluids. And in this one, I wanted it to be metallic because so you could see that the normals are actually proper and they look right, so you can render it. it most likely, you're not going to have a T1000 pig in your game. But if you wanted to, you at least you know that, yeah, you're getting data that looks right and accurate out of Houdini. And then, yeah, this is spiral. And then this one, I only have it in black and white, but I actually have the temperature uh, being animated over time as vertex color. So then you can pass that into the vertex shader or to the pixel shader and then just do the regular ramp thing that you would do like a black body-ish ramp that you can just uh, get proper color into it. Um, yeah, and then this is the cloth one. And then the cloth also has normals and everything kind of works. Um, I work on a crappy GTX mobile 950 and then I get my fans blowing at me um, but, and I don't even know why the fan, it's just anytime I open Unreal, it just kind of starts to get up like the, I can play, um, and you can see like it's running at 60 and I'm recording, so it might be dipping below, but yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. It is, so you can scale it. Um, let me see if I can get the material up. So like I have basically controls over the speed. Is that the right one? So let's see if I do two, no, if I do point one, you can basically play, because you're just controlling the UVs, you can do whatever you want with it. It's just scrolling the UVs down. So you're just controlling the speed of the scrolling. Uh, the one thing like that I'm not doing, but you could do is actually blending it. Um, because if the only one that you can't do that is with the vertex, the fluid one, because you don't know where things are and you don't know where the points are, so you don't know from frame to frame there's no coherence, um, so you can't get a vector to kind of know how to the position of the last frame when the position of the, this frame is to kind of interpolate behind it. But for all the other ones, you could just sample it twice and then blend it by yourself. Um, absolutely, yeah, you can. And even like even playing slow, it's not. You got a little bit of stepping, but it's not like. Yeah, da, 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 da. You can, um, but it, it's kind of up to you, and all of them. Yeah, but you're just controlling it. The other thing that we started talking to is like, you can just make this a manual uh, slider, right? Like, it doesn't have to be driven by time. It can be driven by gameplay. Right. So you could have something that is like you animating blend shapes moving. It doesn't have to be a simulation, right? You can just have data that gets animated and you just drive it with a parameter yeah yeah so you can do things like yeah exactly if you're looking at something like a flower blooms and then if you look away from it it kind of shrivels like that kind of stuff you could totally um, do that kind of stuff which is interesting um, so yeah like the the simulation one is the kind of immediate uh, usage case for it but there's 
Uh, you guys are gonna come up with way cooler stuff. And this is like me pressing shelf buttons, right? It's like you guys are gonna do, like just Magnus can do a lot better. Well, Magnus is a badass, but um, he can just take a file that he already had and made something really cool. But if you guys already have that in mind, you can design things around it and you can do things um, to do that. And I think actually Magnus can offset the, the speed or the, the kind of time based on position. So if you have multiple of these together, you can just offset the time based on the position. So now they don't repeat by themselves. So like if I copy this, they're gonna be playing exactly at the same. Um, so if you don't want that, you can... So like in his case, like the way I would do the lava field is I would have the lava as a soft one that's just kind of like doing wobbly things and just kind of looking cool. And then I will have a individual little kind of sprout bubble that kind of comes up and then rips and then kind of flutters. And then that would be an asset that I would then copy and paste in and move in and rotate it and scale it and do some shenanigans with it um, and kind of break it out that way. I have one example now with me uh, where you can combine these together. So you can have a rigid body with debris falling through and the debris is sprite and then it kind of hits something and then it turns and catches on fire and then that's fluid. So you can have all of the things together. So you can have rigid bodies falling into water that so you can have the rigid body simulation going and then you have the same data coming from the simulation so you can mix and match them and kind of have them playing together in sync Are they, sorry, there'll be different assets yeah no 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 yeah like yeah yeah it would be however many like i have three assets <laughs> whereas like i have the rigid body and then i have uh the other one let me see i might have this up that's open and this is my horrible map of brokenness that I work in so apologies in advance um, exactly so in here somewhere yeah that guy so that I have so you have the rigid body kind of going and exploding and then I have the little debris that doesn't look like it just looks like dots and then I have the pyro kind of going and doing a, a smoke afterwards and then the the next thing that's kind of like the next challenge is figuring out how to render this thing so it's like figuring out if you're gonna do some remarching or like how you're gonna get the, the fluid to render properly for smoke. But there's a ton of things you can do like world position colors or world projected colors that kind of just fade and cross dissolve. And you can do Fresnel because you have the normals and you can fade things around. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can make this run. But for our cartoon, there's actually uh, something done with Alembic in the real-time effects group where they just hand-drawn effects and then they generate a mesh for each frame and then they just play that back with Alembic, but they could do it this way to where it just kind of like you do a drawing and you do like a traditional effect and then you do a trace and extrude and smooth kind of basic workflow and then you have a kind of 2D effect playing back, um, which kind of lends itself to the kind of meshy feel of it. Any other thing I can share? So like if the node itself, this is what it looks like. Um, this is the kind of big simulation which is again just me being following tutorials um, because I'm not an effects artist. Um, yeah. How do you get the normal set of if you wanted to recreate? You go to where is it? The ocean tools, right? I can, but I won't because I'm gonna oh. not have it work and I'm gonna be recorded and it's not gonna work. But let's do it afterwards, okay. and we can try it because it's. It's kind of like I'm already kind of risking it doing live demos and having it not I explode in my city. Huh? I know. <laughs> camera time is important. Yeah. Um, yeah, but so here's the, the kind of you copy and paste it, and basically whenever you run it, you're going to get these values be updated. So you just copy and paste these into the shader. Um, you get the number of frames, which is basically like how you need to get it to, to animate properly so you know what your range is. And then you just have a drop down, right? It's like, you, what, what do you want to export? And you can go in and see exactly what I'm doing. So basically here we have the four kind of chains driven by a switch. And if you want to go in and modify whatever you need to, so like this one is the soft, this one's the rigid, fluid, sprite. If you guys know who you need, this shouldn't be anything kind of fancy or new. Um, if you go into here, you're gonna see, okay, here's the static mesh where I have to read in my static mesh and then generate the, the UVs. And then here's, I have the textures and the normals, and this is the camera that I used to render it. And then they're, they're very simple networks. Like this one is the most complex, which is where I actually do the, the writing out of the points, which is basically I just, I have to figure out where they're gonna be and then do the kind of wrapping around it. But even that's not super complicated. But, and then this is where I sample the color. I do the color. I'm actually swizzling uh, the position because why up? 
but I should add a switch in here for this, which I will. And then I can normalize the data. I can pack the normal. So if you want to check my math on how I'm packing the normal, this is where it is. So this is completely open and you guys can modify it and do it as you will because that's what you guys are going to do in games like people take the, the rigid body exporter and then add perforce works into it or they change it because they don't want to export FBX, they want to export a custom format but they want 90% of it except the FBX part so then they can just go in, open it, change the FBX or whatever file format they want to get out of it. Um, maybe. Uh, which one? Oh, the actual, like what it looks like? So this is the cloth one. And then let's hit the alpha. Yeah, so it just looks like gibberish. Um, but then it's basically that. It's like you can, you can kind of see what it's because it's cloth. You can kind of start to see what the patterns look like. And you can start imagining random stuff in it. Um, but yeah, like the one thing is like uh, compressing with vector displacement map as opposed to HDR, that's gonna drop it in half because now it's a uh, low dynamic range. So that's the one kind of gotcha in here. The other gotcha is on the mesh themselves. You wanna use uh, full precision UVs, especially if you start getting into larger textures. And that's because basically using floats instead of halves. So as you start to pack those UVs really, really close together, they will start to try to grab the data from other textures or from other cells. So by using full precision, then you'll make sure that the, the UVs are gonna kind of line up perfectly. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of shenanigans that you guys don't wanna get into with like, the UVs need to be offset by half a pixel so they're not at the edge of the pixel, they're in the center of the pixel. So if there's any kind of movement, you can kind of make sure that you're sampling it properly. And then they also have to be halfway on the pixel perfectly so you can line it up and then pushing it out and then making them wrap, but then if it doesn't wrap perfectly, you're gonna have padding. And then the other thing too is, because the triangle ones, they need to be in threes. If you have a texture width that is not divisible by three, you're gonna have basically some ending. And because like 1024 is not, and then you kinda just have to, like usually everybody just types in 1024 and I wanna be able to support it. You're gonna have a, a strip of like two pixels that are black at the end of your texture because I need to kind of have the triangles together because if I have to wrap the UVs across, then you're gonna have a triangle that has two points here and one point here, and it's gonna sample all the UVs kind of cutting across, and that's a mistake that I did, and I found out that you have to kind of split it up and, and do that stuff. So how are you snapping the UVs to the middle of the pixel? Is that something you can do in the Yeah, that's just what I do in Houdini, like because I can just explicitly say where they are, I just say, okay, this is oh, okay. exactly yeah, where, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just put it exactly where I need it to be. And that's, that's, a, that's a good piece of information that if you didn't know that, yeah. you could be running into all kinds Exactly. Of yeah, and there's like there's random little things like just getting the frames wrong. Um, so I can show you guys what that looks like. So like if I take this shader and then if so like the frame number of frame is seventy nine, but if I type in eighty, you get that. Because just the data is gibberish and you're indexing in the wrong thing. So one of the things it's like, oh, I have one from 80, so there's 80 frames. No, there's 79 frames because it's, it's yeah. the number of it, it's not zero. Um, so that's one of the things that people will get it in and type in 80 and be like, hey, what's going on? Um, so making sure that, but then it, it's it's really hard debugging it because it kind of doesn't work until it works, but when it works, it's flawless. And so it's 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 tricky. It's trying to keep tricky to get it to work, especially when you're developing it. There's a little bit, so like with the rigid body, I ran into some stuff to where basically the bounding box became too big. And then I just, because I pack it from zero to one, the precision kind of goes away. So like if you have kind of stray, you just do an explosion of a building, like that building gave me some trouble to where I just have it. And then there was one piece that just like shoots off into infinity. So I actually do a bounding box and then I just kind of like make sure that it stays where I want it to stay. And I just snap anything that's outside of that to kind of go back into space.